the Joe Rogan experience. When you're talking about the end of Moore's Law, what, what is the limitation that we're facing technologically? Like, why is it going to, why, are there, there, why is there going to be a point where they can't get any more powerful? So the way uh, the chips work is you have these, uh, you know, they wind up sketching out uh, basically wires onto the, the silicon chips. And they have gotten so small that the wire that the current's flowing through is a handful of atoms wide, which is just astounding if you think about it. You know, these are these fundamental uh, elements of matter, and the wire is this small integer number of atoms wide. Now, in theory, you can keep going down and say, well, maybe we can make a one atom wide uh, electrical path. But you wind up running into, eventually, all these quantum effects where if you make a very narrow wire and you pack them very close together, you have two wires there. An electron won't necessarily stay on that one wire of conductor that you want it to be on. Because of the way uh, quantum mechanics work, it is going to wind up jumping. They call it quantum tunneling. There is a percentage chance, and quantum is all about randomness like that. But an electron flowing here, there's going to be this chance that it just teleports essentially to a nearby wire. It takes this discrete quantum jump to another wire. And this is reality. It's shocking. It's not intuitive. Uh, people have a hard time kind of grasping a lot of this, but quantum tunneling is a real thing. And we are bumping into quantum limits. They can still shrink more than we are right now. We're, we're down at seven nanometers in the latest uh, stuff, although there's all sorts of issues with marketing speak about exactly how they measure it, but they're still getting smaller and there's still room to get smaller still. But the end is in sight. It can't go too much. And one of the things that becomes uh, an issue is just the economics of it. Each generation has gotten more and more expensive. If you went back uh, 30 years, there were a whole bunch of semiconductor places that could fab uh, you know, different chips. You could go ahead and have a design and you could shop it out to a whole bunch of different places, find the one that worked best for you. But it's come down to the point now where it costs billions of dollars to make a new fab. And at the high-end processes, you're left with just TSMC, Samsung, and Intel. Uh, very few companies. You know, AMD held on for a while until they spun theirs out. Uh, and it's, it's, it's so expensive. And it, that's one of the challenges where they will, I have full confidence that we'll see a couple more node shrinks. Um, so it'll still make chips cheaper, uh, somewhat faster, more cores on them, but it is going to get an end of the line. But I hold out hope for potential other things. You know, there are directions that, you know, maybe you have your carbon nanotube wires or you're starting able to be able to do some things with photonic processing in different ways. There are possible outs for it, but I don't know that any of them are a sure enough thing to really be counting on at this point. It's so hard for a dummy like me to wrap my head around that. But when you're talking about these wires, so if these wires, it's size dependent, when they get too small, then this quantum tunneling becomes completely unpredictable. Is that what it is? So uh, if you draw out like a probability density function of uh, like you've got a particle and you like to think about particles as being like this hard little billiard ball that's sitting here in this specific place. That's sort of the, you know, the vision that you used to see in grade school textbooks about here's an atom. You've got these billiard balls in the middle surrounded by the electrons moving around. But in actuality, they're really these, I, uh, these distribution functions. They, it sounds so weird, but they have a chance at being in all of these different places. And this is not a curve that goes to zero. There is a non-zero chance that a given atom, you know, could wind up being a macroscopic distance away, but there is a real chance that it could wind up being a few atoms away. So the, uh, you know, the electron moving around at the edge of this wire, if it just says, well, I've got some chance of being over here. And if you've got billions of these or quadrillions probably of electrons moving around in this, even if it's a small chance, eventually it's going to jump over there and enough of them jump over and all of a sudden you've got a wrong bit and you've got a mistake. So we start fighting all of that by doing error correcting codes and doing ways that there's this whole set of technology about how you work with unreliable systems, which starts getting starts, it should start making you feel a little bit uneasy that okay, we're going to have this error rate, but we're going to by this 
carefully crafted codes uh, allow ourselves to constantly be failing, constantly having errors and still getting the right answer Oof. in a statistical enough case. Now, there's a lot of things like the way your cell phone works with the way the radio signal is uh, interpreted. There's a lot of things that do work in this sort of probabilistic way. But when people are used to computers as being this accurate thing where you always get the right answer, that sense of moving to something that has a larger chance or is a more probabilistic computation still feels a little bit sketchy in some ways. <laughs>